In this video, we're going to be discussing thoracic radiculopathies. We're going to start off by talking about their basic presentation, their diagnosis, and then a general introduction to how you go about treating the thoracic radiculopathy. Now, the thoracic radiculopathy, this is the least common radiculopathy affecting the spine. So it's less common than cervical, and it's less common than lumbar. You won't find this in the literature necessarily, but I tend to think that the number of thoracic radiculopathies are actually underreported. And if you think about what is affected by each of the radiculopathies, it'll make sense. So if you think about a lumbar radiculopathy, those generally affect one or both legs. Obviously, you need your legs to function properly to be able to do ADLs, right? You have to be able to walk, you gotta be able to stand, stairs, etc. If somebody has a cervical radiculopathy, that usually affects one or both arms. You gotta have your arms to be able to do ADLs effectively, whether it's chores around the house, driving a car, etc. But then if we consider a thoracic radiculopathy and all those thoracic nerve roots, they play no role in controlling the legs. And they really play no role in controlling the arms. You could make an argument that the T1 nerve root uh, does play a role for the fingers in the hands, but overall, no role for the legs and negligible role for the arms. And so for those reasons, a thoracic radiculopathy is not going to disrupt the performance of ADLs as much as a lumbar radiculopathy or cervical radiculopathy would. So if somebody has a lumbar or cervical radiculopathy, they're gonna be more likely to go into the doctor, into physical therapy and get rehab for that, less likely with a thoracic radiculopathy. Not to say it doesn't cause pain, and not saying it can't disrupt ADLs, but just not to the extent as the other two. Now, that being said, a thoracic radiculopathy is going to have a presentation similar to that of the other radiculopathies. So for example, with a lumbar radiculopathy, generally speaking, they're gonna have some kind of low back pain, but also radiating symptoms down one or both of the legs. The same thing's true of a thoracic radiculopathy. So we can say P1, is some sort of localized thoracic spine pain. And that pain could theoretically occur anywhere along the thoracic spine. But let's consider something for a moment. Let's talk about, let's say, a disc in the thoracic spine. So when you have a disc in the cervical or lumbar spine, it's excessive flexion that tends to cause that disc to protrude posteriorly and impinge something like a nerve root, right? So excessive flexion is gonna be bad and then usually extension is good. Well, if we look at the thoracic spine due to that kyphosis, if we compare that to a vertical line, that kyphosis kind of creates a relative flexion at rest. There's already a degree of flexion there that can predispose some of these discs for posterior protrusion. Okay? Now, where in the thoracic spine is that curvature the greatest? Well, it's not at the upper thoracic spine because you're transitioning to the lordosis of the cervical spine. Same thing's true of the lower thoracic spine. There you're transitioning into the lordosis of the lumbar spine. So the degree of kyphosis is gonna be greatest at the mid thoracic spine. That's also where you tend to have the greatest flexion torque or flexion moment on the spine. So if there's going to be an issue with an impinged nerve root, it's normally something around the mid thoracic spine. But that's not to say you can't have a radiculopathy above or below that, okay? Now P2 isn't necessarily a pain, I'm just kind of referring to this in general as some sort of sensory change that's gonna be in the vicinity of the painful region and it generally follows a dermatomal pattern. So here's the map of the dermatomes of the body and let's take for example the T6 nerve root, okay? So P1 would probably be localized thoracic spine pain somewhere in that vicinity but then you'd also have some kind of sensory change that follows this T6 dermatomal pattern. So here it is on the left side. It can actually wrap around the side and actually move anteriorly. I know this is the right side over here, but it wraps around anteriorly, okay? Those sensory changes uh, more commonly are gonna be posterior, okay? They could be anterior, but more commonly posterior. And those sensory changes include numbness, tingling, and that burning, stinging pain, okay? So if you've got both of these things combined, P1 and P2 here, it's more likely that the person has a thoracic radiculopathy, okay? Now, their symptoms are gonna tend to be exacerbated by the following. Thoracic flexion, especially if it's quick 
and it's repeated. And this thoracic flexion also can kind of go along with prolonged poor posture. If somebody is slouched over a lot of the time, that's excessive thoracic flexion. You could also call it thoracic hyperkyphosis. So it could be a postural thing, it could also just be repeated flexion that tends to occur strongly or quickly. I'll tell you a little story here. I actually at one point did have a thoracic radiculopathy. It started back many, many years ago. I was actually a chemistry major a long time ago in undergrad, and we had to give a seminar, and it was actually the week before finals. And it was over the weekend before that seminar week. And this is in April, and allergies were terrible. And so when I sneeze, especially when allergies are pretty bad out, I tend to have these very violent forward bending sneezes. And I was doing them, I couldn't stop, and it started to hurt my back, but I couldn't stop sneezing. And then one sneeze in particular, a really strong one, violent forward bending, and it just was horrible. Um, it kind of was manageable that day, but when I woke up the next morning, it, my whole thoracic spine was just stiffened up, guarded, it was really, really painful. Very similar to what happens with the low back when you try to pick something up and twist really quickly. You end up with those muscular spasms, everything's locked up, acute hypomobility. Very similar to that. But mine was not caused by a postural thing. Mine was that repeated thoracic flexion from the sneezing. And believe it or not, that's actually a pretty common uh, mechanism of injury uh, in this type of condition. Okay? But thoracic flexion can exacerbate symptoms. Prolonged poor posture can, especially that hyperkyphosis. And then prolonged standing and prolonged walking, especially if that speed is very slow. These are other things that can exacerbate these symptoms. Uh, actually, continuing on with that story, eventually I decided to apply to physical therapy school. Um, so I had to get volunteer hours. And the clinic that I was shadowing at, um, the way it worked is you just kind of stood around and watched the physical therapist. You're not a student yet, so it's not like you can actually help out. Uh, so you just do a lot of standing. And I noticed over the course of an hour, uh, that's all it took, the, the thoracic spine pain just got worse and worse and worse. Eventually when I left, and I usually walk pretty fast normally, I'd be walking to my car and I'd notice, well, as I'm walking fast, the pain goes away. Okay? Now the symptoms tend to be relieved by, well, sitting down, um, because at that point you're taking some of the load off of the thoracic spine. You're not having to stand up erect. And then thoracic extension, tends to relieve the symptoms. Early on in a thoracic radiculopathy, if the symptoms are pretty severe, sometimes thoracic extension can be painful, but over time, what you actually tend to see is that thoracic extension is good, and you actually want to use a lot of thoracic extension-based exercises, okay? Now, going back to that story one more time, fast forward a few years in the future, I'd actually gotten into physical therapy school, got through all the didactic courses, and now I'm on clinical rotations. And it was my very last clinical rotation. It was a neuro rotation. And so in a neuro clinic, you, you know, gate train people around. And generally speaking, most of them are pretty slow. There are patients that have had strokes, they have Parkinson's disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that walking slow, again, is something that really kind of aggravated my symptoms. And also standing up for long periods did. And in that rotation, I actually started to develop uh, those sensory changes. And it was really for me just tingling. I didn't have numbness. I didn't have burning, stinging pain. It was just tingling. And I found that any time I went into thoracic extension, it literally just took two or three seconds and the tingling always went away. Very reproducible. And generally speaking, the pain also did, but that took a little bit longer to go away. Okay. Um, what I ended up doing for it is I just did a lot of thoracic extension, rotation-based exercises, scapular retraction and depression-based exercises. Eventually, the symptoms totally gone. We'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. Now for the diagnosis of a thoracic radiculopathy. It's not as straightforward as you might think, and that's because there's no special test for a thoracic radiculopathy. When you look at a cervical radiculopathy, for example, you've got upper limb tension test A, You've got Sperling's test, distraction test, etc. And there's even some others not in the cluster uh, that are helpful. But there's nothing like that for a thoracic radiculopathy, let alone the thoracic spine in general. Um, really, the only special test that I can think of off the top of my head that's commonly used is spring testing. And so to diagnose a thoracic radiculopathy, you really have to do two things. Number one, 
you have to look at this cluster of symptoms up here, and if the person satisfies most of those, then it's more likely that they have a thoracic radiculopathy. And then number two, we'll see this on the next slide, you actually have to rule out other conditions causing these symptoms. You have to go through the differential diagnosis. And if you've ruled those out, then you can say with some degree of confidence that the person has a thoracic radiculopathy. The other thing that you can use is thoracic spine spring testing in general CPAs. So putting the pressure centrally on the thoracic spine and doing posterior to anterior a springing. And if it's a positive test, that also rules up a thoracic radiculopathy. So that begs the question, what's a positive test? Well, when you're doing the spring testing, you're basically biasing thoracic extension because we're doing this in prone. Now, in some individuals, that thoracic extension you're providing by the springing can actually relieve symptoms. That would constitute a positive test. However, I've also had individuals where you do that springing initially at the start of treatment, and it actually aggravates the symptoms. You won't find this in the literature, but from my personal experience in the clinic, positive test we can just say is a change in symptoms. If you are springing on the thoracic spine, on the painful region, and it changes the degree of that pain along with the numbness, tingling, or burning, stinging pain in any way, whether it's an increase or decrease, that makes it more likely you're dealing with a thoracic radiculopathy. And now for the differential diagnosis. Here's some conditions that you might want to rule out before assuming the person has a thoracic radiculopathy. The first one is posterpedic neuralgia, which is something someone will have with shingles. If the person has never had chicken pox, then they can't have shingles, so they can't have posterpedic neuralgia. But again, if somebody's going to have this, uh, they probably also have other symptoms of shingles. So if they don't have those, you can rule out posterpedic neuralgia. Chronic abdominal wall pain, malignancy or cancer, other spinal disorders like a spinal cord tumor. Um, if somebody has a spinal cord tumor, they might also have some upper motor neuron signs. If they don't have those, well then it's probably not as likely that they have this. Infections, metabolic conditions like osteoporosis or osteomalacia. And then deformities like kyphosis, scoliosis, compression fractures, a Schoerman's deformity. Schoerman's deformity is a pediatric condition, so they will have had this their whole life. So that means it's pretty easy to rule out. If they didn't have it their whole life, well, then it's probably not a Schoerman's deformity. Um, excessive kyphosis, uh, scoliosis, these are spinal conditions that don't necessarily uh, go with a radiculopathy, but they certainly could go with a radiculopathy if there's potential for compression of the nerve root. But generally speaking, these are going to cause just kind of localized upper back pain. It could be visceral referral from one of the abdominal organs. And then other MSK conditions like polymyalgia rheumatica, myofascial pain syndrome, rib fractures, costochondritis. Those latter two conditions are associated, of course, with ribs. So with those conditions, maximal inhalation and exhalation will probably be painful. And you should be able to put light pressure on the rib or the costal cartilage in the case of costochondritis and provoke that pain. If you're not able to provoke the pain, it's probably not something associated with ribs. And then also neurogenic conditions like intercostal neuralgia, peripheral polyneuropathy, chronic regional pain syndrome in the thoracic spine. But again, most of these things are very uncommon. So if somebody has the presentation on the previous slide, more than likely thoracic radiculopathy. If I suspect somebody has that, do I go through ruling out every single one of these? No. But again, if I'm treating the patient and they're not getting any better, it makes it more likely that it could be one of these, okay? And then for the causes of a thoracic radiculopathy, we've kind of touched on this a little bit. We've talked about the hyperflexion type of mechanism with sneezing. We've talked about postural considerations. So these are just more specifics for those. A thoracic disc protrusion, if that disc most commonly in the mid-thoracic spine, that protrudes posteriorly or posterolaterally has the potential to compress a nerve root. Weakness of the thoracic paraspinals and also the scapular retractors and depressors. Again, these are muscles that help you maintain an upright posture. If they have poor endurance or poor strength and you're in prolonged standing, they're going to run out of energy and fatigue. And so that makes it more likely that you're going to have an increased flexion moment on the thoracic spine, and it makes it more likely that you'll exacerbate those symptoms, particularly the sensory changes, okay?
Um, limited mobility into thoracic extension and rotation. Very, very tight muscles, particularly the ones in the front, the scapular protractors, the thoracic flexors, the pec muscles. Okay? When those are tight, it's going to limit thoracic extension and rotation. Again, predisposing someone to developing a radiculopathy. And just in general, upper crossed syndrome. Now, in terms of the treatments for thoracic radiculopathy, like most conditions in physical therapy, there is no cookie cutter approach. There is no recipe book. You're going to specifically address each of the roots or causes. Okay? So if the person has sufficient scapular retractor strength, but you find their thoracic paraspinals are weak, you're going to focus most of the exercises on strengthening the thoracic paraspinals. Right? Maybe they don't have a postural problem. Maybe it's not upper cross syndrome, but they've got a disc protrusion. Again, you're going to focus then on more repeated thoracic extension type of exercises. Okay? So you're going to identify the impairments and then specifically treat those. There's very few conditions where you follow more of a recipe. This is not one of those. This is where we're actually finding impairments and specifically treating those. And then in the next video, we're going to be discussing treatments for a thoracic radiculopathy. I know I just said there's no recipe book, but these are some good exercises and treatments to consider when you think somebody has this condition. So hopefully this video gave you some good information on thoracic radiculopathies, and make sure to join us in the next video when we talk about the treatments. Thank you. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.